This is, I would say, the active defense, which basically does not go out from this frame saying that Ukraine is on offensive and it is some invader or something less. No, it is not. It is a part of the defensive operation. At the same time, I would like to remind you that this nuclear state acted as an aggressor against Ukraine and therefore Ukraine acts in accordance with the norms of international law. Since they never thought that the war could move to their territory, the fighting in the Kursk and Belgorod regions uh, shows Putin's weakness and in fact undermines his authority in Russian society. Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project by Ukraine Media Center and enjoy your Atlantic course. And I'm your host, Miroslava Yaremki. The operation by the armed forces of Ukraine in the Kursk region is the most effective offensive of the entire war. Ukrainian intelligence identified weak points in the Russian defenses and special forces crossed the border in advance to prepare the area. When the armed forces of Ukraine crossed the Russian border on August 6, it was a textbook example of what strategists call a combined military maneuver. Thanks to the operation in the Kursk region, Ukraine not only changed the course of the war with Russia, but also strengthened the resolve of its allies. Ukraine may be able to lure three southern Russian soldiers into a pocket. Once captured, they could become a valuable bargaining chip for many Ukrainian POVs held in Russia. In today's episode, we are going to talk about the strategic aspect of the Kursk operation and why Ukraine decided to cross the Russian border and occupy some of its territory. If you want to learn more about this subject, please continue watching this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our videos in the future. The primary goal of the operation was to shift the mood within Russia, making the war less appealing and turning key figures against Vladimir. Putin. Additionally, after last year's unsuccessful counteroffensive, Ukraine needed a morale boost. With this operation, Zelensky reminded Ukrainians that victory is still possible. This message also resonated with Ukraine's allies in Europe and the US, some of whom had started to question their support for a war that seemed unwinnable. Now it's clear that if our NATO partners permit the use of long-range missiles in Russia, Ukraine will continue to make gains. The third objective of this offensive is to pull Russian forces out of Ukraine. Capturing many prisoners of war was also crucial for future exchanges. Now the mothers of Russian conscripts are advocating for continued prisoner swaps. Expert in security policy Archil Tsinsadze will talk more about it. Well, there are a lot of um, analysts analyzing the Kursk operation uh, from the bottom to the top, saying and describing whatever is happening there. But uh, today I also wanted to speak about Kursk. Uh, I wanted also to, to give you my opinion about that. Uh, of course, we could we could discuss how it was conducted and what the outcomes will be with this from this operation and then uh, what would this operation show us. But basically, I'm not going into that details. I wanted to stress out only just only three um, points. The first of all, that saying that it was brilliant operation. I believe it was brilliant because it was an answer um, now of, to the, to the uh, Russian strategy of the meat grinder. And the strategy was well exploited and well used by Russians on the front lines. And they were just going forward and forward, just destroying everything. And one could simply try to find something else to seize the initiative, which is basically what, what happened. And what I would say uh, that uh, this uh, asymmetric answer uh, is uh, is the uh, really good um, try to to seize the initiative. Um, also, we are saying again whatever the outcome would be from the operation, and we could you know just discuss the, the several outcomes what may happen uh, in or after uh, how during during or, or after this operation. But the, the, the main point is clear that uh, what we see here that in the era of um, uh, total uh, info flow and uh, 
um, uh, total monitoring of e information, some covered operations and the huge size, the big size covered operations are still uh, possible. So one could conduct in uh, in this uh, satellite era and uh, one could conduct the really covered operations and then give um, the really uh, asymmetric, I also mentioned already, asymmetric uh, surprise actions to the enemy. Uh, second thing I would also say um, here that <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, one one could realize that when when the world speaks that that uh, Ukrainians have to be have to defend their cities, the country, and and everything else. Well, this kind of defense uh, is is uh, well on on the one hand is 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 right. You have to defend your um, uh, territory and then the, the cities and the villages and everything else. But at the same time, any any successful offensive operation in this. Uh, scope of being, you know, just on the defense here is also the part of the defense, and and this is this is I would say the active defense, which basically does not go out from this frame saying that Ukraine is on offensive and it is some invader or something less. No, it is not. It is a part of the defensive operation, and it it is especially designed again to conduct successful defensive operations somewhere else. Um, uh, I also I also wanted to stress that uh, the, it is it is really important because we already saw several times that uh, any any future planned operations uh, uh, well somehow were revealed and somehow were discussed before they happened. So um, informational silence was also a part of this operation. It, it, it's a good part and I'm surprised. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that the Ukrainian side did not do any announcements as it was before the offensive in the last year and uh, all this uh, press and, and uh, uh, the Telegram and all these um, the middle bloggers, they were shouting from, from every uh, every every uh, device saying that while well, Ukrainian would be on, on offensive and uh, it, then the, the offensive was failure. Now this time we see that Ukrainian also learned to to be in the um, uh, I would say uh, informational silence, which basically helped to conduct successful operation, and it still continues, which is also is is really welcome part from my side, saying that well, good, we have to keep the silence in order to to uh, to maintain this. Um, um, initiative and then keep on moving forward. If Vladimir Putin responds to the events in the Kursk region by mobilizing forces, it could put him in an even worse position than he is now. Therefore, he is downplaying the Kursk operation and trying to restrain the Ukrainian military with a minimal number of forces. Russian control over the mass media is strong enough for propaganda to support this narrative. The Russians are very afraid of fighting in the city of Kursk itself if the Ukrainian military advances that far. Russian authorities are unwilling to acknowledge the possibility of such an event and fail to realize that the war could backfire on them. Yevhen Mah, the director of the Institute of World Politics, will share his thoughts on this historic Ukrainian military operation. The offensive operation of Ukrainian troops in the Kursk region which is still ongoing, has every reason to take its place in history. This is the first time when the troops of another state entered the territory of a nuclear state, the largest in the world. At the same time, I would like to remind you that this nuclear state acted as an aggressor against Ukraine, and therefore Ukraine acts in accordance with the norms of international law. Russia will not declare war on Ukraine, because if it does, it will put Ukraine on the par with itself, and this is absolutely disadvantages for the Kremlin. The Kremlin handed over the fight against the Ukrainian offensive to the special services. Botnikov and Dumin are persons who enjoy Putin's special trust, and I think this will continue. However, uh, Russia received a very powerful blow and a large number of Russian prisoners of war can become a factor in destabilizing the situation in the country. Uh, therefore, their ombudsman, Moskalkova, initiated negotiations on the exchange of prisoners. And Ukraine, I hope, will try to exchange all for all. Uh, today, 
with its offensive, Ukraine has postponed possible negotiations with Russia indefinitely. It has demonstrated to the West, China and India, as well as to the Global South as a whole, that Russia is not as strong and powerful as it appears at first glance. That is why Ukraine is making history, and we should be proud of it. As noted by scholar of the law of war Yoram Dinstein, military operations in a self-defense war can legitimately occur anywhere in the war zone, without the need for artificial geographical limitations convenient for the aggressor. It would be absurd to claim that a victim of aggression cannot conduct hostilities on the aggressor's territory, especially when this territory is used to launch attacks. The Kursk operation should not be seen as a separate conflict, but as part of the broader conflict caused by Russian aggression against Ukraine. Under international law, the right to self-defense legalizes all actions aimed at repelling aggression. More on that, please welcome journalist and writer Yuri Lukanov. We have a long history. And in certain years of this history, the territories of Kursk and Belgorod regions of present-day Russia were parts of Ukraine. A lot of people still speak Ukrainian there, but it doesn't mean that we occupied these territories in order to cut them off from Russia and annex them to Ukraine. We respect international law and believe that countries must stay within their recognized international borders in accordance with international agreements. And Ukraine and Russia signed such agreements with each other. This is what makes us different from Russia, from Putin, who explained his military adventures by saying that he was going to return historically Russian territories to Russia. And that is, he considers all of Ukraine, with the exception of Galicia, uh, to be such a territory. Besides, he calls us a single people, but says that Ukrainians are brainwashed and don't realize that they are actually Russians. This is absolutely imperialistic thinking. So, why did Ukraine cross the Russian border and occupy part of its territory? Firstly, in the Russians' view, a leader of the state uh, enjoys authority if he shows strength. Uh, can come to another country, occupy its territory, and defend his country. Since they never thought that the war could move to their territory, the fighting in the Kursk and Belgorod regions uh, shows Putin's weakness and in fact undermines his authority in Russian society and, make sh and may shake Putin's totalitarian regime to the point that it may fall. This is one of the goals. The second is demoralization. Actually, it is within the framework of the first idea. Uh, Russian society as well as the Russian army is being demoralized, because they could not imagine that they could suffer such defeats. Uh, Russian servicemen seem to give themselves up in the hundreds there are probably 600 prisoners during this time. Uh, this means that the Ukrainian exchange fund has grown by one and, and a half. So all this is done to speed up Ukraine's victory. And there is another very important point. We've crossed another red line. And the Russian constantly promise through the mouths of their leadership that as soon as red line is crossed, they will use nuclear weapons. The Ukrainians have finally crossed the thickest red line, occupying part of Russia's territory. And what? Nothing. No nuclear weapons were used, they will obviously never use it. This move dispels Western fears that the fearsome Putin will use something that will make the whole West shudder. This opens the way, takes away the arguments 
uh, of those who have been slowing down the provision of weapons to Ukraine, fearing that the Russians will respond with a nuclear strike. So this offensive, the occupation of part of the Russian territory, has only one goal – the capitulation of Russia, victory for Ukraine, and of course, when it's all over, will return the Russian territory to its owner, so to speak. That is, uh, will return it to Russia. You've been watching a special project by Ukraine Media Center and Euro-Atlantic course dedicated to the Russian-Ukrainian war, Ukraine in Flames. In the description under this video, you can find information on how you can help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. If you find our work useful, please like and share this video. Slava Ukraini!